Good afternoon. I'm Stuart Baker, member of the Aspen Homeland Security Group uh, and Washington lawyer. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say someone who has been uh, uh, fielding calls from Brian Bennett, who will be leading this uh, uh, panel uh, for at least a dozen years. Uh, uh, this is probably a good time to take up those misquotations. No, maybe not. Uh, uh, Brian is a remarkable reporter, uh, worked for Time, covered uh, Afghanistan, covered Pakistan, was uh, covered uh, 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 the war in Iraq uh, from Baghdad, uh, and was mem a member of a team that won a Pulitzer for coverage of the San Bernardino killings and the uh, uh, investigation that follows. He will be leading the panel uh, through its paces, and without further ado, Brian. Thank you very much, Stuart. And thanks for always returning my call on deadline. Uh, so this panel is called Seeing Around Corners, the Intelligence Professionals Challenge, and particularly honing in on the puzzle of the unknown unknowns, um, a famous Donald Rumsfeld phrase. And um, as DNI Clapper said yesterday, uh, the country is currently facing the most varied number of threats that he's ever seen in his many decades of security work. And so this panel is particularly topical for right now. And fortunately, we have um, three people who have um, spent their careers thinking about intelligence and uh, how to keep countries secure. Um, first, we have, I'll introduce the three of them, and then we'll have a discussion about um, what the intelligence community should be thinking about and preparing for the future. So first, we have uh, Leslie Ireland, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Intelligence and Analysis. Leslie has been the head of the Treasury's Office for Intelligence and Analysis since 2010. She also wears another hat. She is the intelligence, the National Intelligence Manager for Threat Finance for the DNI. So what that means is that um, she has to do the thinking about how the entire intelligence community should be using threat intelligence, financial information intelligence. Um, so it's a really interesting um, person to have on the panel. Uh, Leslie also has a full career as an intelligence officer. She's been an intelligence officer for 30 years. Uh, she was the intelligence briefer for President Obama. She was the Iran mission manager for the DNI. And she spent many years at CIA as an analyst and manager on the Middle East and WMD and other issues. And particularly topical for now, she has a master's in Russian area studies from Georgetown. Um, next, we have John Scarlett, who was the head of British secret the secret British Secret Intelligence Service, also known as MI6, from 2004 to 2009. And uh, also during uh, John's career, uh, he had postings for MI6 in Russia, East Africa, and France. Uh, he speaks French and Russian. And um, I assume he's very familiar with how Russian intelligence th services think and operate, which is particularly topical right now. And on the end here, we have Greg Treverton, who is the chairman of the National Intelligence Council. Now, the National Intelligence Council reports to the director of national intelligence, and it's like an internal think tank for the DNI. Uh, Greg's job is to think long term about the intelligence needs uh, for the intelligence community and for the country and what's coming next. Um, this is also the body that produces the country's national intelligence estimates. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to hear um, things that he's thinking about. I'll also mention that Greg's office um, produces a report every four years uh, that we'll be asking him about that's called Global Trends. And just so happens that that report, um, which often comes out right around the time of an election, um, is due out in December. Um, so we'll get to hear. Um, Safely after November. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's a report that will be on the next president's desk, so we'll be able to hear from Greg some of the deep thinking that they have done, his office has done, about what the future of intelligence and the intelligence services needs are for the next 10 and 20 years. So with those introductions, um, I wanted to uh, start on the news. Um, obviously, we have the DNC hacks. There was a report last night from Reuters that we have yet another hack um, that uh, cyber security officials have attributed to the Russians on the DNC. This time it was DNC donor information. And what I want to bring up, bring this up, is uh, we are now 
at a point in our history where um, you know, Russia has become more aggressive in its actions to go to the United States and project its power. So you know, let's just review the basic facts of what we know so far. We have a, a cybersecurity firm, CrowdStrike, reputable cybersecurity firm, that has um, said there's a high degree of confidence that Russian intelligence is behind the, um, the hack of DNC emails several months ago. And then those emails appear on the internet. And then a uh, senior official, the, the head of a major political party in the United States, resigns as a result of those emails. And so that brings us to you know, where we are now. And that the question is, you know, what should US and Western intelligence agencies be doing now to adapt to this new reality from Russia? And what tools does the intelligence community need to prevent Russia's actions and better understand what Putin's going to do next? And I'm going to throw that first to Leslie. Thanks. Um, so the first thing I would want to assure the audience is that cyber activity is a high priority for the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, we annually sit down and develop something called the National Intelligence Priorities Framework. And we work with the policy community to identify where the intelligence resources capabilities need to be focused. And I can assure you that cyber takes uh, some of the highest priorities that we've got. Um, I'm, I'm looking at that question a little bit more from my perspective within the Treasury um, Department and looking at how we work with our Office of Domestic Finance to work with the financial sector and help protect them in terms of uh, cyber activity against an array of actors, not just perhaps Russia, but against the full array. And one of the things that we've been able to do is to help leverage what the intelligence community has through the Office of Domestic Finance with the financial sector itself. And I think as an intelligence <laughs> entity, we need more, more broadly to look at how do we help the broader infrastructure inside the United States. And the DNI has a group that does partnership engagement, and I know they're looking at that, and I think that's something they need to continue to do. Uh, the second thing I would say, and this I think gets to your question of tools, um, I would want the analysts as well as the collectors who are looking at this problem to understand that we have an executive order that was signed last April of 2015 uh, that would allow sanctions against um, actors involved in malicious cyber activity. Uh, and obviously that gets into a whole array of questions about being able to prove the identity of the actor and having the right information and then moving forward on a sanctions pack package, but I know that's something that we would be prepared to do. So I want to just follow up on that. Financial intelligence has become more and more important in finding out the weak points for adversaries, mm -hmm. um, particularly you know, when it comes to an adversary like Russia. Um, what kind of information is useful in finding out how sanctions can be effective? So let me give you a vignette, and I know we talked about this beforehand. A um, colleague of mine received a, in the mail his uh, hotel honors card. You know the one that you flash when you want to get points uh, for staying, a loyalty card for staying at a hotel? He opened it up and it had a picture of people whitewater rafting. He thought, that's cool, I, I love whitewater rafting. He looked again and he saw a guide that he had been rafting with. And when he looked the third time, he was in the boat too. Um, and that program is run by a major U.S. financial institution. And what I would contend to you is that what they were able to do was to follow his financial activity, uh, follow purchases that he made, follow travel that he might have made. Um, that trip was in West Virginia, and he didn't stay at that particular hotel. So it wasn't a case where they knew because he stayed there. Um, and I think they also probably used facial recognition, facial recognition software at the same time to create that picture of, of him as a customer. I believe that within all of the legal authorities that we have um, in the intelligence community and the law enforcement communities, we can create that kind of picture as well of, of our adversaries by watching that financial footprint that whether you like it or not, each and every person in this room stepped into it today. So that's incredibly creepy. Um, to, <laughs> to, think, to, to think that a private company is collecting that much information. Um, I hope Obviously, that's not being used on American citizens, but I can see it as a useful tool against uh, intelligence adversaries. And right. Before this becomes the tweet that's heard around the world, <laughs> I'm not talking about the intelligence community using this as a capability against U.S. citizens. I'm talking about it with our foreign adversaries. So John, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, 
how intelligence services need to get better at getting inside the mind of the other side and their adversaries, if there are new tools available, if there are old tools that we need to use better. Can you talk a little bit about that? <coughs> right, well, um, it's looking around corners, uh, getting into the minds of the other side. I mean, there are a range of basic tasks I've learned, I think I've learned um, over the years, um, that intelligence can achieve uh, that maybe it's very difficult for any other arms of government and society or government uh, to, to achieve. And, and they, that can be done in, in various ways. At the end of the day, uh, it's just being very well informed uh, in quite a deep and complicated way. Uh, so it's not just of having items of information, it, it's understanding and, and looking at the world or a problem or a confrontation or whatever it might be um, in the way that somebody else looks at it, not yourself, or some other society looks at it, not yourself. I mean, it's an obvious point. It shouldn't need a stressing, but of time and time again, I, I have found it in my mm. career in the past, when I look back on it, <coughs> and I find now that we're not very good at it. Uh, and maybe we're particularly not very good at it in our sort of society, because we sort of live with the belief that we know best and we're more advanced than everybody else and we have universal values and, and all this uh, kind of thing. Uh, and um, there are various ways in which you can uh, obviously do this, and I can cite examples, I think, both from my own experience, but also from history um, and recent experience, probably, um, of, um, of where it's been you know, particularly effective and different techniques have been used. So in the final stages of the Cold War, for example, and understanding exactly what uh, thinking was going on at the very top of the Soviet leadership and um, in the Politburo, uh, you know, there were examples and there are examples of us learning that and being surprised by what we learned and us learning it through good old fashioned human agents, human sources. Nothing else was telling us exactly the way uh, the Soviet leadership in the early 80s was thinking, for example, about, uh, uh, about the possibility, in fact, probability of a US policy under President Reagan uh, to launch a nuclear first strike against the Soviet Union. And indeed, when that intelligence came through, we found it unbelievable. And policymakers just simply didn't believe it, but it turned out to be true. Now, that were you, were you that came from a human source. Were you, okay. were you producing some of that intelligence in Moscow in the early 90s yourself? Well, I wasn't in Moscow um, at that time, but um, without going into too much detail, <coughs> it's been quite well written about and publicized. Um, there was, in fact, a very good German TV uh, uh, series, uh, Deutschland 83, um, about it, or based on it, a few months ago. Uh, but uh, the, the key intelligence came from an extremely brave human source inside the KGB that I was involved with, yes. So I know about that. But that's, um, you know, that's just that's one example um, there uh, where we succeeded because we had intelligence. But if you take another example, a uh, sort of technical example, going back, back a bit in history uh, to 1944 in uh, May, May the 25th, I think it was, 1944, uh, when the Japanese ambassador went to have a three-hour conversation with Hitler in Berchtesgaden, and Hitler told him what he thought was going to happen uh, when uh, the invasion across the channel, inevitably, that was inevitably coming, was going to come, and that it was going to come in Normandy, or maybe somewhere else, and along the western French coast, but it wouldn't be the real thing. The real thing was going to come a couple of weeks later in the part of Calais, which is what we had been trying to convince. Uh, the uh, German high command was indeed going to happen, and we knew from that, and so the Japanese ambassador went back to Berlin and sent a very long report, as Japanese ambassadors did in those days, back to uh, Tokyo and gave a full account of the conversation. And through Bletchley Park and all that, we read that report within a few hours of it being sent. So we knew from that what was in Hitler's mind critically, you know, less than two weeks before one of the most important events of the 20th century and of our society's existence. And that enabled us to double up on the deception and to put it, you know, a large numbers of uh, uh, German mm -hmm. armoured troops were kept in the part of Cali area for two weeks after the invasion of Normandy and uh, until the beachhead was secured in Normandy. Now, if that's not important, I don't know what is. 
but that came from technical intelligence that you were seeing into the mind of the other side. And just finally, um, a, a more mundane example <coughs> where I think you know, we haven't succeeded sticking with Russia for a minute, but one could go into other areas, of course. Um, I was in uh, Moscow um, in the early 90s, 91 to 94, um, the moment of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So and I was the service representative. It was quite an interesting job to have in those days, um, partly, of course, because my service was one of those that was blamed for the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, it's annoying now when I find CIA blamed for it because I find... I, <laughs> you want the credit for it. Yeah, I found it. <laughs> quite, anyway. And um, <clears throat> the, I saw then, you know, the impact of the collapse of the society, which had many tragic aspects to it, I have to say. Um, but I don't think I did understand, and I think hardly anybody understood, the humiliation that it involved for uh, the leadership and society generally in the uh, Soviet Union and then Russia at that time. And we live with the consequences of that humiliation now. Uh, but if we had understood it better at that time, perhaps we might have managed it better. We thought we were doing a really good job of managing it, uh, but in retrospect, perhaps, we didn't really understand how the new world looked um, to the, the population, the leadership of Russia at that time. So to pick up on that, I mean, that is taking us into the mind of Vladimir Putin a little bit, who obviously uh, seems to be acting on a certain amount of that resentment from that time. Um, my, my, my next question is, in the last 10 years, the US and I imagine the UK and other intelligence services have become so focused on terrorism and retooled themselves. Um, I wonder if uh, they took their eye off of the other great powers like Russia and China and didn't have enough resources focused on looking at those countries and whether um, there's currently a calibration going on and, and what should be done in the next 10 years. Greg, can you pick that up? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, that you're right. There was, uh, obviously, counterterrorism is for obvious, very obvious political reasons, very top of the pops. It's always, it dominates my day every day. Sometimes I feel like I do all ISIL all the time. Uh, and so it is really important, particularly from where I sit, to try and remind people that there are lots of other important issues out there. And I think Russia is an example of us not exactly taking our eye off the ball, but as Jim Clapper put it, Yesterday, it is a kind of a zero-sum game, particularly given declining resources. So if you're doing a lot of something, you're probably doing less of something else. And so I think the community, the American community, did a good job of keeping its eye very much on China, recognizing that China was the main game out there. But it did, I think, resources devoted to Russia did go down fairly dramatically. And so we're now trying to rebuild a bit our capacity to even understand basic order of battle things, to understand their technology. And as John said, we spend a lot of time trying to get inside Putin's head, which isn't so easy. Uh, but it, and that the, the kind of, you can't understand, I think, his actions without understanding the kind of humiliation he feels. And that makes me, if you ask the uh, what keeps you up at night question, mine would be that Putin would miscalculate in some way that took us to an Article 5 crisis, and therefore to a very different world. Uh, that, that means we do spend a lot of time trying to get inside uh, Vladimir Putin's head. Not so easy. So uh, Greg, your office is, uh, is currently writing uh, the Global Trends Report. Um, it's going to come out in December. Um, this will land on the desk of uh, the incoming president. Um, can you bring us through sort of what the critical issues are that you, that you and your office have seen in the next 10, 20 years? Absolutely happy to. We try in Global Trends, it's obviously completely unclassified. We try and look out five years and then 20 years. The great thing about it is if you're trying to look out even two years, none of that stuff on your classified computer helps. You really need to be out talking to experts and others. So we will have been in about 35 countries and touched about 2,000 people by the time we finish Global Trends. Let me just give you the highlights. I don't want to scoop us, uh, and indeed it's not yet entirely written, but uh, we'll, the big uncertainties, I start with two big uncertainties, even over five years, but particularly over 20. And no surprise, I think those two big uncertainties are China and us. What kind of role China and the United States are going to be playing in international politics both five and 20 years out. I don't get to talk a lot about the United States, but in this case, we will some. 
And if we look at the five-year look, five-year look is really mostly the playing out or how might play out the kinds of issues we've talked about the last couple of days. Top of the list is China, cyber, then Europe's troubles and Russia, and then, for me, Middle East, terrorism, how does ISIL morph? Those are very much on our minds, but trying to think creatively about how those might play out, even in five years, is a big piece of the task. I always remind myself that we think history sometimes goes slowly, and sometimes it does, but if you think the uh, amount of time between Mr. Reagan's evil empire speech and the fall of that empire, one decade, a rather short time even in human life. Then for the 20-year look, let me just tick off the kind of big trends we're trying to get our arms around in the 20-year look. First would be the increasing empowerment of individuals and small groups. Again, not new, but striking. Previous versions of global trends, we talked about the power shift to Asia. That's still continuing. But the empowerment of single individuals is striking in the case of terrorists. But it's also striking in the case of the Gates Foundation, which spends more on health in Africa than the World Health Organization. Second on this list is the structural change in the global economy. <clears throat> we imagine, like many other people do, that there'll be a period of slower growth than we were used to. That's going to make almost everything harder to solve, increase in inequality, and create a kind of scramble for middle class jobs because so many, a billion people, have been risen out of poverty in the last generation, they'll be in danger of falling back into poverty. Third will be clashes of values. What's most striking to me is <clears throat> we Americans have a kind of prosperity presumption that says prosperity makes everything better, makes people happier, more democratic, less likely to go to war, and then we bump into ISIL that cares none about that, has no such presumption, doesn't care a bit about it. Less striking are the Chinese attitudes toward international financial institutions and others. They see those as made in America or made in the West. But clashes of, 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 uh, of values will be a piece of the future and how that plays out. Two more. One is technology. There we're going to focus, I think, on artificial intelligence and on bio. The uh, artificial intelligence first effect there will be, I think, significant disruptions in job markets around the world as more and more jobs are vulnerable to or actually taken over by technology. Uh, bio, we know we're on the cusp of something enormous. Bio, I think, is about today where IT was 25 years ago. The kinds of advances we'll see will be wonderful, life extending, life improving. But we're intelligence analysts, and it's said of intelligence analysts that when they see flowers, they think of coffins. So we're, uh, needless to say, also mindful of how uh, bio advances might lead to designer bio weapons targeting ethnic groups or even single individuals. Last on this list uh, would be really what seems like the growing disconnect between people and their governments around the world. Often it gets labeled populism, sometimes nativism. Uh, we've seen it in our country. We've seen it strikingly in the Brexit vote in Britain. And so thinking about the implications of that 20 years out, will that mean that societies that are now tolerably well governed fall into bad governance? Or will there be new forms of public-private partnership that supplant our existing arrangements? So thanks, thanks for that, Greg, for that overview. Um, one of the things that the intelligence community is tasked with is, is predicting events and being, having the um, leaders of our countries uh, prepared to handle unfolding dynamic events like the Arab Spring, for example. The U.S. intelligence community has been criticized for not predicting the Arab Spring. Um, and uh, and a, a recent uh, event was the coup in Turkey, for example. Um, I spoke with a senior U.S. official who first started seeing information about the coup in Turkey breaking on Twitter. He told me an anecdote where he called his counterpart in the intelligence community who hadn't seen the um, information on Twitter popping up. It had just been out for about 20 minutes, and, and he had to go and, uh, and find out what was going on. So that brings us to how is um, this social media feast of information going to change the way that the intelligence community looks at information, all the information that's available there in the open source. Leslie, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Greg to chime in. 
So um, one of the responsibilities of an intelligence analyst is to be able to evaluate the information mm -hmm. that's in front of them. Frankly, not all intelligence is created equal. Uh, some of it is sourced better than other parts of it. And as part of our trade craft, we train analysts to look at the sources, evaluate them before they come to a judgment. So what I would say is on social media, I've often heard, but it was on Facebook, it was on Twitter, it was here, it was there. Um, wh why didn't you take that into account? And I don't think it's a case where they didn't take it into account, but in fact, there's a whole new science that's going to have to be developed and is being worked on in terms of how do you evaluate the information you get on social media because you don't know the identity of the person who's putting a post on Facebook or who's putting out a tweet. Um, it could be somebody right in the middle of things. It could be a foreign intelligence <coughs> service who's trying to mislead you. It could be any number of things. Um, but I think we're growing in our capability of being able to take that social media information and integrating it better with the classified sources that we have. Greg, you want to weigh on that? Yeah, no, I think that gets it exactly right. I mean, in the case you mentioned, <clears throat> Ryan, is there what you'd hope is you'd get a tip. You know, we know about all the open source stuff, particularly social media. It's hugely voluminous and completely unreliable, right? And so trying to make some sense of it. But you probably could get a tip and say, well, maybe, is a, is a coup entirely unthinkable? What we've been doing in my Africa work, for example, is there's not a lot of great intelligence on Africa, but there's a lot of data. So we have a data scientist looking for data, not all big data, but just databases. And there what you find is the data is plenty good enough to help you foresee famines or disease. But beyond that, what I hope is we can get out of it sort of tips like the one you suggested. Should you, shouldn't you look here? Shouldn't an analyst take this connection that he or she hasn't thought of before seriously? So I think it's a really big deal for us, but it does have the huge challenges of reliability and just processing because the, the volume is so, so enormous. Well, we're in this new world. Do you want to weigh in? <coughs> well, I'd just like to challenge to some, uh, to some extent what you sure. just said there about the, what's expected of the intelligence community and also right. distinguish between predictions of some you know, events. Uh, let's say a coup in Turkey, mm. that, of course, is clearly um, uh, a role for a security service or an intelligence service, starting with the Turks, one has to say, uh, to... <laughs> I mean, if Erdogan didn't know the two was yeah, coming, yeah, it's going to be yeah, hard yeah. for other intelligence to, um, uh, to predict that that might happen. Uh, and uh, given the number of people apparently involved, it is quite surprising that it came as a surprise. But that's a particular kind of event. Uh, the Arab Spring is a completely different uh, kind of event. And I would push back very strongly against the idea <coughs> that that was some kind of intelligence failure. Uh, you, it's not the job of intelligence to predict uh, events, and they're not events. I mean, they are enormous movements, trends. It's like it was not the job of the intelligence community uh, to predict uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, which is lucky because nobody did really predict it. Um, I mean, it's a much broader thing than that. It's for political uh, analysis, it's for diplomats, it's for a whole range of uh, capabilities uh, that a sophisticated global government will have. Um, uh, and, and there are some, in fact, by and large, my experience has been that the, mm. the biggest changes, and most strategic changes, certainly that I've seen, like the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the Arab Spring, actually, 9-11, uh, are almost by definition unpredictable. Uh, the job of a really well-informed and skilled government machine is to be able to understand very quickly, once the event has happened, to be able to understand it and then to behave in order to react to it and to manage it. I think that's a much more realistic uh, way of looking at things. But it's, it's the idea that somehow or another these really big things are... You know, it's the responsibility of intelligence to predict. It is not the responsibility of intelligence uh, to predict. Uh, in my um, experience, and we need to be clear about the different kinds of events we're talking about. Can I just extend that a bit? If you look back at the intelligence record for the fall of the Soviet Union, the particulars were all pretty good. We understand how bad, what bad shape their economy was in, military, we all understood all that. What we didn't do, or what they didn't do, or my predecessors, is put it together in a story that said this is leading to the fall of the Soviet Union. So we know the sp knew the specifics, but it's always creating the story, creating a credible story. And indeed, the first people who created a story about Gorbachev didn't believe it, because they were people like Bob Gates who said, he's destroying the Soviet Union. He can't mean to be doing that. 
Uh, so they created a story but didn't believe it. I always think it's the story that's critical, because if, if there's no story, then the individual bits of information are just kind of factoids. What you need is some credible story. But imagine an intelligence analyst in the 1980s trying to write a story about the fall of the Soviet Union. Probably would have found him, himself or herself counting submarines in Kamchatka Island, right? Uh, that's that's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> so social media presents this opportunity for understanding the world better. At a, it also presents a liability for human intelligence, for intelligence collectors, for people trying to operate covertly. We all walk around the, the world and we have this digital exhaust as we use social media, as we use credit cards, we have financial transactions. Um, can you talk a little bit about both the benefits of that from an intelligence collection perspective and the difficulties it presents for doing covert actions, getting people um, moving around the, the world without being um, traced by adversaries? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, obviously, um, you know, as somebody who did used to move around the world, uh, uh, sometimes uh, not being me, as it were, um, and obviously that's much more difficult and more complicated um, uh, uh, than it used to be, but nothing is impossible. Uh, the You're going to tell us what your favorite disguises <coughs> were? Uh, mustache. Uh, they wouldn't fedora. be difficult to guess, actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, but I, um, uh, I think, again, we need to be so careful in understanding it as we categorize different kinds of information flows and what they can, what we can reasonably expect from them and what we can't. So again, going back to your story about uh, the, the Turkish coup and it coming up on, on Twitter, that, of course, is completely, I mean, that's really interesting. It's really interesting uh, that that should have been available, you know, 20 minutes or whatever it was, uh, before uh, the US government sort of picked it, um, uh, picked it up. And there are other examples of that. I think the same is true about the Brussels attacks uh, back in March. Now, that is telling us something that we need to think about. Uh, and we really need to think about. And of course, there are other things that social media can do. The sheer scale of it, I mean, the 500 million tweets a day, um, means that there is actually a global pattern of activity. So it's not just the individual items that might come from, let's say, a coup but it's also the overall picture of events. If you suddenly get an outbreak of, of violence over a few, a half an hour or an hour in a certain part of the world, which is politically sensitive, um, then you, know, you might pick it up from uh, watching that. Uh, and of course, that's the kind of area where lots of companies and so on are now engaged, and governments have got to learn how to incorporate that into their analysis and it's, a, it's an example of where, if you like, private sector capability is relevant to government um, analytical capability in a way which was never true you know, for much um, of, my, of my career. And it's one of the changes taking place in this area. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, one of my colleagues in the Defense Intelligence Agency says, selfies are our best friend. Uh, because boys will be boys, and they take pictures of themselves in the back to their girlfriends, and so therefore it makes it hard to, for them to say, no, I wasn't there, or for Putin to say, no, there wasn't any Russians there. Uh, we've actually seen selfies that had in the background weapons that we hadn't seen before. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. The real challenge, I think, is as we move to a web that is more pictures than words, then the challenge we all face is trying to figure out how to interpret those pictures make use of those pictures, that I think is the, the challenge in front of all of us. Uh, Leslie, I wanted to talk to you a, a little bit more about how financial intelligence is driving the future of intelligence collection and also policy recommendations from the IC. Um, you know, you've got a huge new amount of information about people's tra financial transactions, about countries' economies. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that um, has, has given the, the intelligence community new opportunities to find weaknesses in our adversaries, to put, pr find pressure points to bring people to the table, um, find pressure points on Russia, find pressure points on Iran to bring them to the negotiating table? Sure. So um, let me back into it first and, and uh, talk about the Iran piece, and that is, um, so the sanctions program depended upon a huge amount of intelligence. And that's because when the Treasury Department works to sanction an entity, an individual, um, a financial institution, what have you, 
um, and Treasury currently has um, over 30 sanctions programs. Um, there's intelligence that's marshaled that identifies vulnerabilities and provides that useful information to the policymaker who can then implement the sanctions. The, a package is built. Um, it's called an evidentiary. And it is actually reviewed from a legal standpoint because the Department of Treasury, specifically the Secretary or the Director of the Office of Foreign Assets Control, can be sued uh, by an individual or entity that is sanctioned. So you really need to have a very, very strong case um, to take forward in order to implement sanctions. It's not done on a whim. It's not done on a, well, I think they're doing this. It's done on a, um, a, a with a reason to believe that this activity is going on. Um, the reason I think that's important is that sanctions are not designed to punish for past behavior. They're designed to encourage a change in future behavior. And so to get to your point, the information that we were using on Iran to, to come to a point where I genuinely believe the sanctions brought them um, to the negotiating table because of the impact on <coughs> their economy, because of their, um, uh, you know, that, that they were isolated within the international financial sector, um, that information is still very important to us moving forward. We, we have to keep a uh, very close eye on Iran, both from the perspective of um, the implementation of sanctions that still remain on terrorism, on ballistic missiles, on human rights abuses, et cetera, but also because the JCPOA includes the opportunity for snapback sanctions if they do not follow with the agreement, or um, it actually can confirm that they are behaving in the way that we wanted them to behave with the sanctions in the first place. Getting to the broader question about financial information, when I started six years ago and uh, Jim Clapper asked me to be the national intelligence manager for threat finance, I found that people tended to see financial information solely through the lens of, of sanctions. And um, I took a lot of time as the NIM for threat finance to help show people that um, you can use it for other things. Now, I knew, I knew I'd been in the job too long when I'm, I'm driving down the Dulles toll road in the morning and I drive through the toll booth and I look up and I look at the transponder and I think, where are we collecting those overseas? Think about the information you can get from a toll booth transponder. <clears throat> you've got pattern of life, you've got somebody's vehicle, You've got access to their financial accounts, whether it's a credit card or a bank account. You've got access to their driving records. I think that information is out there, and it's a matter of pulling it in, pulling it in in a way that the entire intelligence community can use. That's something that we're working on right now. And I think that eyesight, so this cloud-based, integrated IT infrastructure that the DNI is building the IC toward will be part of that. Part of that is having the right tools to sift through that data because some of it is structured, is in spreadsheets, and some of it is very unstructured. We've worked on that with DARPA to develop specific tools to be able to work through the financial information. And a lot of it is training and educating people that you've got a cyber, you've got a cyber group. Maybe the way to understand how that group is interrelated is to, is to follow their financial activity and to see the connections that are made through the financial activity because the fact is, People only transfer money because they know who they're sending it to. This is, this is not like a wrong number when you pick up the phone. Money is transferred intentionally. Let's hone in a little bit on Iran and the Iran deal. Your office has been uh, tracking the um, you know, financial intelligence coming out of Iran. Have you seen any indication that any of the um, money that's gone back into Iran at, in result of the sanctions coming out have gone to the um, Quds Force or the IRGC? That was a, as it was a concern? Um, so I can't answer that directly. But what I will tell you is that um, it, it's our belief that the Iranian government certainly recognizes that they have got uh, economic difficulties on their hands. So um, in other words, they've got high rates of unemployment. They've got high rates of inflation. They have a real um, that is struggling. They have an oil industry that they have neglected for decades that they really have to bring online since oil still remains their primary source of hard currency earnings. And it is our belief that the money that they are gaining access to now primarily will go towards the 
uh, funding for the economy. Um, that's not to say they couldn't um, want to prioritize some of that and put it into the nefarious activity that they've been involved in. Um, but our basic expectation is that the vast majority of it is going to go back to the <coughs> economy. As we move into the information age, the demands on the workforce in the intelligence community have changed. Um, we're going to open it up to questions shortly. Um, but before we do that, I was just wondering if any of you had any thoughts on ways that the intelligence community can find the right people to hire um, to, to do the work that they need to do. I'll just make two points on that score. One is uh, I think we've done an okay job at beginning to respond to the needs of big data. So we've now, various of the agencies have created new positions for data scientists or data analysts. Hard because in the first go round, the data folks weren't sure what the regular analysts needed or did, and the regular analysts weren't sure what the data folks could contribute. But the second round is getting better, so I think we're doing relatively well there. We've also done a decent job at making the workforce look more like uh, America. But I think for me, the real challenge is the next level down, taking advantage of diversity so we get adv advantages from the number of languages and ethnic backgrounds in the country. Uh, so we get some differences of view. Our challenge is that once you've put people through a polygraph, uh, you may have homogenized the people you're getting. You don't get a lot of wild and crazy people who might have wild and crazy ideas through the polygraph, and that's a real challenge. So trying to, from my perspective as an analyst, trying to increase the diversity of thought, that's a challenge that, that's much harder for us. John, do you have any thoughts on that in high school? <laughs> well, um, I was at one stage uh, a few years ago uh, responsible in our service for security and vetting and counterespionage and so on. And one of my jobs was to stop us recruiting wild and crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> and if you did recruit a wild, one wild and crazy person, you know, the lesson was, and any uh, professional colleagues here would uh, know what I'm talking about, they could do untold damage you know, across the organization. So you couldn't afford to do that. Uh, but you've got to be careful because uh, uh, homogenous uh, issues are, are, of course, a threat. And if you, uh, um, I mean, when I uh, joined a long time ago, I'm not going to say how long, um, in my first interview, they wouldn't tell me what it was I was being um, interviewed for. And when I asked at the end of the interview, well, what is it that I may be joining? It's a government service. Well, what does it do? Well, it provides support. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I said, well, support to whom? Support to people who provide support. <laughs> uh, and that was as far as I got, you know, after an hour or so, and you know, then, then it got better. Uh, now, a great change has been when people are recruiting into a career service, and, you know, these are career services still, which is an issue too, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, then it's done publicly, so it's all open. And that is... That is the best way um, to avoid copycatting yourself. Um, and it's not, it's not difficult to you know, attract people to work for a service like MSX because everybody wants to do that. But the problem is um, filtering out, you know, getting the right people and not the wrong, wrong people and so on. Uh, <coughs> but um, reflecting on the diversity of society, um, of course, is increasingly complicated. Uh, not least, because, um, of course, probably anything else, you have nationality rules, and they certainly apply <coughs> in the United States. They apply in the UK, too. I was once asked by a parliamentary committee, why was it that we had to insist on uh, recruits to the service career uh, uh, being British? And I sort of said, it looked to my amusement, one of the most left-wing MPs on the committee <coughs> thought this was a great <coughs> joke and uh, laughed at it a lot. And the obvious answer was, because it's the British Intelligence Service, you know. I can't easily discuss this any further. But you can see that that brings with it you know, issues about diversity and homogeneity and, and, and so on. And, and of course, we've got to get out there um, recruiting new skills, particularly data skills, analytical skills, which originally, you know, a long time ago, we didn't have to think about. Well, let's see if there's any wild and crazy people out there who want to ask some questions. So <laughs> please, please raise your hand and um, identify yourself ask a question and wait for the microphone. Thank you very much. Here in the blue blazer, that's you, yeah. It's black, that's why I was confused. Uh, this is a, is a question, uh, uh, Mark Mabry, director of the National Cybersecurity FFRDC at MITRE. My question is for the director of, of the NIC, but really it goes to all the panelists. 
Um, one of my favorite things about the uh, Global 2030 report was uh, the uh, glimpse of hope. Uh, you actually predicted, forecasted the growth of the Chinese middle class and their desire for <clears throat> increased uh, reduction in corruption, improvement in the environment, improvement in education, the same kinds of things that the U.S. middle class cares about. And you predicted, forecasted, I should say, that, uh, that we would have increased stability globally. So uh, I'm curious if you have an update to that forecast, but equally importantly for the other panelists, what is your glimmer of hope for the future? On, uh, on China, uh, as I said, it, it for me is one of the two big uncertainties as I look out. And the question there is whether they will get through their current political difficulties and the middle income trap they're in and, be, and get to a point of decent, if not very plural, governance and decent economic growth. Uh, so that's, that's the, the big uncertainty about them. Uh, more, um, I realized when I did my run through the trends, it's a pretty dystopian view of the world and therefore trying to look for glimmers of hope. I keep asking everybody, uh, since you look at the Middle East and all of the trends are going in the wrong direction, I keep asking, does anybody have a hopeful sign about what's going on in the Middle East? Um, so far, the hopeful signs turn out to be places like Iran, right? So it's not, uh, <laughs> when that's your hopeful sign, that's, it's not great. But it is, I think, incumbent on us to, as we do this, to make clear that, that a lot of this future we're trying to shape is really in our own hands. The, the, the things that we can't, we don't run the world or control the world or the dominant powers as we once were, but we're still absolutely necessary to make things happen. So trying to find what uh, my colleagues call opportunities, I don't much like that idea, but opportunities, places where uh, there are silver linings, where uh, things might get a lot better. That's obvious in the technology area, but in other areas as well, that's a, that's a big challenge for us. So Greg, just to follow up on that, when you talked about the um, big things the intelligence community needs to th think about in the next 10 years, China was at the top of your list. I mean, what, give us the opposite of that, the doom and gloom. Why is China so important for the intelligence community to think about in the next years? What, what could go wrong? Well, I, two things, one is, I, I, as I said earlier, I think it's, a, it's pretty uncertain, and the bumps in the road for China, which we knew were coming, we knew economic growth was gonna slow, that's happened, but now the combination of slower economic growth with the backlash against the corruption campaign, with the stalled economic reform, that makes me think that its course is pretty uncertain. The worry is that as its internal sources of legitimacy get less, that it will turn even more toward South China Sea and nationalism abroad. That, that's sort of the five-year future I foresee and worry about. Obviously, the other reason for thinking about China is it is the second most important country in the world, and therefore it, it uh, deserves a place at the top of the list no matter what. Before we go to the next question, any glimmers of hope? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> of course, the difficulty uh, for intelligence professionals, analysts, or operational officers, and so on, uh, and you look at the world, your job is to look for problems and for things that go wrong. So inevitably, you're Mr. Gloomy Boots. You know, that is, <laughs> uh, and I have this problem the whole time, and I'm asked, because uh, I'm good at spotting problems, and so on. Uh, uh, but actually, you'll find that many intelligence uh, operational people and analysts are actually within themselves natural optimists. Uh, and so you have to be, you know, resist that temptation. And a purely personal, uh, personal reaction is that uh, um, I would say, um, it's, it's a, I don't want to sound like a U.S. presidential candidate, but I, I am, uh, China may be the second most important country in the world, but by a long distance, the United States is the most important country in the world, and, uh, and it will continue to be so. And, and then the community of nations around that um, you know, is fundamentally powerful, resilient, able to exploit opportunities, technology, for example, in a far more imaginative and... Uh, expressive way than we've seen happen um, elsewhere. Uh, if you stick with that, you can be an optimist. Let's take some more questions. Go over here in the blue shirt. Uh, Brett Stevens from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Scarlett. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a YouTube video which had been leaked in Russia and caused a small scandal when recent graduates of the FSB uh, tooled around Moscow in $100,000 Mercedes SUVs. Uh, what does this tell you as an intelligence professional about the culture and caliber of the FSB today? 
When I was um, in, in Moscow working with FSB colleagues um, in the early 1990s, the um, monthly salary for a lieutenant colonel was $130. Uh, I remember that well. Uh, so that would suggest that there's been a bit of a change in their salary <laughs> profile. Uh, actually, I suspect there might not have been that much. Um, I, I, you know, yes, I read, of course, that story. Um, and, uh, Disinformation. I, <laughs> Somebody interfering there, and um, I, I was um, uh, I was very interested in it. You probably find the whole evening was funded by you know somebody. I, I don't know it, the story didn't actually say that, but those officers will not have that kind of money at their personal disposal. I'm quite uh, sure, and it's important to remember too uh, that uh, a security service like that has lots of good professional people in it. They're not just there to sort of throw money around and be boastful and do you know, whatever their bosses tell them and so on. It's a much more you know, disciplined and <laughs> complex uh, structure than that. So you know, one has to be sort of realistic about it. So I'd, I'd say, in other words, put that story into some kind of uh, context. It was probably an oligarch. <clears throat> Next question. Yes. <coughs> Here comes the microphone. Hmm. I'm Jane Harmon. I'm a wild and crazy supporter of the intelligence community. And I would observe that it's stronger because of its diversity and because of our strong liaison relations, uh, especially with Britain. Um, my question is this. Um, traditionally, at least as I understand it, uh, intelligence is not the same thing as policy. Intelligence professionals uh, try to... Uh, project an accurate picture of what's happening and to some extent predict what will happen and get into the minds of the big actors. But then policymakers make the policy. They're not the same thing. And so my question is uh, with respect to the US presidential campaign, uh, what degree of confidence does the intelligence community have that intelligence will be used seriously by our next president? whoever she sure. or he may be. <laughs> I suppose the easy answer is it's uh, up to us to demonstrate that we're useful. Um, we do, you know, intelligence draws this line between intelligence and policy. Most policymakers, in my experience, don't have any similar line. They're just looking for help. And often the kinds of questions we do, a lot of intelligence support, we do the intelligence support for the principals committee and the deputies committee, as you know. Uh, and out of those high-level policy deliberations come just the right sort of questions from my perspective. They'll ask us, if we do X, how will Putin respond? How will it affect his entourage? Those are really trying to ask for assessments of possible policies, uh, and that's exactly the kind of conversation I'd like to have. Uh, whether we'll have it with the next administration obviously depends a lot on personalities. My guess is uh, um, they'll also be interested in help and discover that uh, the intelligence community is a, a pretty good, pretty professional, pretty sensible place to find help. Yeah, go ahead. So just um, a couple of observations on my part. And one of the things that I found very important, um, I started briefing President Obama, President-elect Obama, right after the um, November 2008 election. And, and I walked into that understanding that I had been steeped in intelligence for years. Um, but he hadn't. And so it was really incumbent upon me, and I think any other briefer, is to help, help the president, whoever it is, understand exactly what intelligence means, and understand what we mean by some of our statements, because the way we speak in intelligence language is not normal. Um, <laughs> it isn't. Um, if I were writing this as an intelligence analyst, I would have phrased this quite a bit differently, but the bottom line is to help them understand what the capabilities are, what the limitations are, just what they can expect from the, um, the intelligence community. And then, to, to part of your point, regardless, regardless of the party that is elected, it, it is the job of an intelligence professional to provide the best and the most objective information they possibly can you have to have that, that severe line between intelligence and policy. You cannot be preparing intelligence analysis. You cannot be skewing collection. You cannot be doing any of that in any way to try and influence 
the course of policy. Just to reinforce uh, Leslie's first point, uh, when, uh, when Mr. Obama was elected, Mr. Bush wanted him to get the same President's Daily Brief, mm -hmm. the document that uh, Bush himself got. And one of our colleagues observed that you know, he, Mr. Bush had been doing this for eight years by then, right? And for uh, Mr. Obama, it was like opening Ulysses at random <laughs> to try and understand what this President's Daily Brief was all about. So it's... Uh, John, as an observer um, of the American political process, uh, do you have concerns that one, of, one or two of the presidential candidates might not use intelligence appropriately? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I'm going to sidestep that question completely uh, uh, and uh, make a slightly, I mean, a related but a different um, observation, maybe. Uh, of course, uh, it is absolutely correct, the dividing line for an intelligence professional between intelligence and policy making must be rigid. And it's not, it's not just the individuals who have to recognize that, the whole system has to recognize that. And the structure has to be built around that, and you know, by and large it is. Um, in both of the countries I know best, which are uh, United Kingdom, obviously, and, uh, and the United States. Uh, I think that the challenge for um, uh, a US president coming in, um, and to some extent that's true also for a prime minister actually, but maybe particularly for a US president, is that although uh, the intelligence community of course doesn't know everything and it has lots of gaps, it knows a huge amount. And the, um, and the, and the, the difficulty and the challenge is knowing you know, what, how to form policy and in a way uh, except that you can't get everything right, and you might know the truth of what is happening in a particular situation, uh, but you may not actually be able, I and mean, there may be an obvious right thing to do. I mean, you know, you know that somebody, some head of state is coming to you and is just lying, you know, and telling you something which you know is completely untrue, but you can't actually behave, you know, as a human being, right, in response to that. You've got to have a clever and thought through policy response, and that's very difficult. Uh, and if you're not, obviously for anybody, however good and clever and honest they are, if they come in without experience, um, as a, a very high number of um, political leaders in both our countries do, uh, then that's a real challenge. Um, and it's often not understood just how much the uh, US government in particular, but my own government too, how much they actually know, you know mm -hmm. but they can't say. So I just saw <laughs> the five minute uh, card, and so we'll take two more questions. Um, and then uh, have the, the panel answer it. So um, let's, let's go with this gentleman here. Yep. And uh, this woman here with the black and uh, black. Yeah, that's right. Hi, Joe Simidian from Santa Clara County, California. And I'm just curious, are there noteworthy differences in the philosophy or approach in the British system and in the American system of intelligence gathering? They're different cultures, they have different legal systems. Does that manifest itself in a way that means you have a different perspective if you're a British intelligence professional as opposed to an American intelligence professional? And let's take one more question and we'll have them both answered at the same time. Okay, uh, Gail Harris, Foreign Policy Association. My question concerns uh, intelligence support to the military side of the house. As you know, military strategy is often revolved around their I'd like you to talk about the criticism that the intelligence community needs to get ahead to understand the new forms of warfare, hybrid warfare, that particularly Russia and China are taking advantage of, not just with cyber, but with movement of forces. And for the British gentleman, I'd like to know who the next movie James Bond is gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's start with the, the difference between the cultures of American intelligence services and British intelligence services. Well, the biggest difference is one of resource. <laughs> uh, um, the, um, uh, where's the question? Yes. The, the, one of resource, um, uh, I mean, in, in our terms, in fact, in anybody's terms, uh, the resources available to the US intelligence community and its 17 agencies or whatever uh, are vast. Yeah. Uh, and they're on a completely different scale. Uh, and 
uh, from everybody else, and I'm not sure everybody in America always quite understands that. You know? <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, and of course, there is, a, there is a legend, if you like, out there that, and I often hear it, that uh, the US is very good when it comes to technology, technology and technological collection and all old-fashioned signals, intelligence, or whatever it might be, and the British, let's say, are better at human intelligence. I mean, that's the sort of legend. It is a legend. It is a myth. Uh, both sides are very good at both. Uh, and I can back that up with lots of uh, examples if I, if I had to. It's not completely surprising since they have worked extremely closely together, famously, uh, since 1941. This is the 75th anniversary year of the special relationship I can think I can claim. Uh, and, and obviously, therefore, you know, a lot of capability and knowledge and understanding it and so on is, is shared, although there is a difference of scale. And if you're from my side, you therefore got to prioritize you know, in a way that otherwise you wouldn't do. And you'll have slightly different, I mean, you will have different interests and so on. And so you'll be pursuing them. But if fundamentally, I don't think there is a sort of fundamental uh, structural or cultural uh, difference. At least I can't, you know, I, I wouldn't immediately uh, uh, pick on it. And I, I would just <clears throat> echo that from an analytical standpoint. I came up through the analytical ranks, is that we will have intelligence exchanges. And it's oftentimes you, you understand that a service, by virtue of their um, their threat perception or their national security concerns may have a focus on an area that you're interested in. And so maybe you go and you talk to one service um, in one area and you may talk to another service in another area because you know that's where they have to specialize because their resources are so scant. And because frankly, the global perspective in the United States is that we need to be on top of everything. And it is through those partnerships um, that we are more successful. Exactly. So to, to the, to the final question was, um, how does the intelligence community adapt to these asymmetrical threats um, from China, creative things being done by Russian intelligence services to um, destabilize different, um, the political discussion in the United States, um, asymmetrical threats from, through terrorism? So do you want, do you want to Happy to start. Um, it's obviously something that's very much on our minds. It is, uh, I think it's a task for all of us. Uh, the military, there's a big military intelligence establishment. The services have their, their intelligence agency. So it's, I think it's a task for us all. What we're trying to do at the NIC is really think about the future of warfare uh, in, a, in, a, in an era when all the technologies we have, our adversaries are gonna have, from nano to drones to all of the rest, uh, when the line between combatants and non-combatants is gone, and these are really wars between societies. So cyber, there's no difference between the kinetic and the cyber realm, they're interconnected. So trying to think our way through the really fundamentally changing nature of warfare, in some ways even warfare doesn't sound like the, the right term for that if we, encompass, if we want to encompass uh, gray zone war, hybrid war, all those are things that uh, I think are, the, are a real challenge for us but something we're working hard at. So I'm getting the zero minute card, John, do you want to have the uh, Well, um, as a non-American, and you mentioned uh, for, for maybe the second or third time, the DNC uh, point, I think uh, advice, just calm down. You know. it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's become, there's a sort of frenetic atmosphere um, around it. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, technically, we can work out almost certainly who did it, you know, the original hacking. Um, it shouldn't be that big a surprise. You know, this sort of thing has been going on one way or another in the pre-cyber age and the, the post-cyber age. Uh, and, uh, and to imagine that it can distort an entire political process uh, like the American political process, I, I just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm influenced by what I experienced uh, back in the late Cold War days when, um, I see it's minus three minutes probably now, late Cold War days, uh, when we were told to get really worried about Soviet and KGB activity and active measures and interference in our political process and so on, and it all turned out to be rubbish. You know. And it had no influence at the end of the day at all because of the strength of our own systems. Uh, so keep things in proportion. So stay, keep calm and carry on. All right, and that brings our panel to the end. Can have a big applause for the panelists. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>